There once lived a gentleman and his wife, who were the parents of a lovely little daughter. When this child was only nine years of age, her mother fell sick. Finding her death coming on, she called her child to her and said to her, My child, always be good. Bear everything that happens to you with patience, and whatever evil and troubles you may suffer, you will be happy in the end if you are so. Then the poor lady died, and her daughter was full of great grief at the loss of a mother so good and kind. The father too was unhappy, but he sought to get rid of his sorrow by marrying another wife, and he looked out for some prudent lady who might be a second mother to his child and a companion to himself. His choice fell on a widow lady of a proud and tyrannical temper, who had two daughters by a former marriage, both as haughty and bad-tempered as their mother. No sooner was the wedding over than the stepmother began to show her bad temper. She could not bear her stepdaughter's good qualities that only showed up her daughter's unamiable ones still more obviously, and she accordingly compelled the poor girl to do all the drudgery of the household. It was she who washed the dishes and scrubbed down the stairs, and polished the floors in my lady's chamber and in those of the two pert misses, her daughters, and while the latter slept on good feather beds in elegant rooms furnished with full-length looking glasses, their sister lay in a wretched garret on an old straw mattress. Yet the poor thing bore the ill treatment very meekly, and did not dare complain to her father, who thought so much of his wife that he would only have scolded her. When her work was done, she used to sit in the chimney corner amongst the cinders, which had caused the nickname of Cinderella to be given her by the family. Yet, for all her shabby clothes, Cinderella was a hundred times prettier than her sisters. Let them be dressed ever so magnificently. The poor little cinder wench, this harsh stepmother, was a sore trial to her, and how often, as she sat sadly by herself, did she feel that there is no mother like our own, the dear parent whose flesh and blood we are, and who bears all our little cares and sorrows tenderly as the apple of her eye. It happened that the king's son gave a ball, to which he invited all the nobility, and, as our two young ladies made a great figure in the world, they were included in the list of invitations. So they began to be very busy, choosing what headdress and which gown would be most becoming. Here was fresh work for poor Cinderella. Cinderella, for it was she, forsooth, who was to starch and get up their ruffles, and iron all their fine linen, and nothing but dress was talked about for days together. I, said the eldest, shall put on my red velvet dress, with my point lace trimmings, and I, said the younger sister, shall wear my usual petticoat, but shall set it off with my gold brocade train and my circlet of diamonds. They sent for a clever tire woman to prepare the double rows of quilling for their caps, and they purchased the quantity of fashionably cut pants. They called in Cinderella to take her advice, as she had such good taste, and Cinderella not only advised them well, but offered to dress their hair, which they were pleased to accept. While she was thus busied, the sisters said to her, And pray, Cinderella, would you like to go to the ball? Nay, you are mocking me, replied the poor girl. It is not for such as I to go to balls. True enough, rejoined they, folks would laugh to see a Cinderella at the court ball. These two stepsisters were very cruel to Cinderella, and ill used her much. Ah, what sweet friends are our own born sisters! There can be no substitutes like them in the whole wide world. Any other but Cinderella would have dressed their hair awry to punish them for their impertinence. But she was so good-natured that she dressed them most becomingly, although they disdained her, and while they would themselves make a great figure in the world, sought to degrade and lower her. See how the lovely disposition of Cinderella shines out. Although she was not allowed to go to the ball of the king's son, she not only advised them well how they could array themselves to appear to the best advantage, but she even what greatness of heart to do that, with her own hands, dresses their hair, and in the most becoming manner her delicate taste can suggest. The two sisters were so delighted that they scarcely ate a morsel for a couple of days. They spent their whole time before a looking-glass, and they would be laced so tight to make their waists as slender as possible that more than a dozen stay-laces were broken in the attempt. The long-wished-for evening came at last, and these proud misses stepped into the carriage and drove away to the palace. Cinderella, looked after the coach as far as she could see, and then returned to the kitchen in tears, where, for the first time, she bewailed her hard and cruel degradation. She continued sobbing in the corner of the chimney, until a rapping at the kitchen door roused her, and she got up to see what had occasioned it. She found a little old beggar woman hobbling on crutches, who besought her to give her some food. I have only part of my own supper for you, goody, which is no better than a dry crust, but if you like to step in 
and warm yourself, you can do so, and welcome. Thank you, my dear, said the old woman in a feeble, croaking voice. She then hobbled in and took her seat by the fire. Hey, dearie me, what are all these tears, my child, said the old woman. And then Cinderella told the old woman all her griefs, how her sisters had gone to the ball and how she wished to go too, but had no clothes or means to do so. But you shall go, my darling, said the old woman, or I am not queen of the fairies or your godmother. Dry up your tears like a good goddaughter and do as I bid you, and you shall have clothes and horses finer than anyone. Cinderella had heard her father often talk of the godmother and tell her that she was one of those good fairies who protect children. Her spirits revived and she wiped away her tears. The fairy took Cinderella by the hand and said, Now, my dear, go into the garden and fetch me a pumpkin. Cinderella bounded lightly to execute her commands and returned with one of the finest and largest pumpkins she could meet with. It was as big as a beer barrel, and Cinderella trundled it into the kitchen, wondering what her godmother would do with it. Her godmother took the pumpkin and scooped out the inside of it, leaving nothing but rind. She then struck it with her wand, and it instantly became one of the most elegant gilt carriages ever seen. She next sent Cinderella into the pantry for the mouse trap, bidding her bring six little mice alive, which she would find in the trap. Cinderella hastened to the pantry, and there found the mice as the fairy had said, which she brought to the old lady, who told her to lift up the door of the trap but a little way and very gently, so that only one of the mice might get out at a time. Cinderella raised the mouse trap door, and as the mice came out one by one, the old woman touched them with her wand and transformed them into fine, prancing, dapple-gray carriage horses with long manes and tails, which were tied up with light blue ribbons. Now, my dear good child, said the fairy, here you have a coach and horses, much handsomer than your sisters, to say the least of them, but as we have neither a postillion nor a coachman to take care of them, run quickly to the stable where the rat trap is placed and bring it to me. Cinderella was full of joy and did not lose a moment and soon returned with the trap in which there were two fine large rats. These two were touched with a wand and immediately the one was changed into a smart postillion and the other into a jolly looking coachman in a full finery. Her godmother then said, my dear Cinderella, you must go to the garden again before I can complete your equipage. When you get there, keep to the right side and close to the wall. You will see the watering pot standing. Look behind it and there you will find six lizards, which you must bring to me immediately. Cinderella hastened to the garden as she was desired and found the six lizards, which she put into her apron and brought to the fairy. Another touch of the wonderful wand soon converted them into six spruce footmen in dashing liveries with powdered hair and pigtails, three-cornered cocked hats, and gold-headed canes who immediately jumped up behind the carriage as nimbly as if they had been footmen and nothing else all their lives. The coachman and postillion having likewise taken their places, the fairy said to Cinderella, Well, my dear girl, is not this as fine an equipage as you could desire to go to the ball with? Tell me, now, are you pleased with it? Oh, yes, dear godmother, replied Cinderella, and then with a good deal of hesitation added, But how can I make my appearance among so many finely dressed people in these mean-looking clothes? Give yourself no uneasiness about that, my dear. The most laborious part of our task is already accomplished, and it will be hard if I cannot make your dress correspond with your coach and servants. On saying this, the old woman, assuming her character of Queen of the Fairies, touched Cinderella with the magic wand, and her clothes were instantly changed into the most magnificent ball dress, ornamented with the most costly jewels. The fairy took from her pocket a beautiful pair of elastic glass slippers, which she caused Cinderella to put on, and then desired her to get into the carriage with all expedition, as the ball had already commenced. Two footmen opened the carriage door and assisted the now beautifully dressed Cinderella into it. Her godmother, before she took leave, strictly charged her on no account whatever to to stay at the ball after the clock had struck twelve, and then added that if she stopped but a single moment beyond that time, her fine coach, horses, coachman, postillion and footman, and fine apparel would all return to their original shapes of pumpkin, mice, rats, lizards, and mean-looking clothes. Cinderella promised faithfully to attend to everything that the fairy had mentioned, and then, quite overjoyed, gave the direction to the footman, who bawled out in a loud and commanding tone to the coachman, To the royal palace! The coachman touched his prancing horses lightly with his whip, and swiftly the carriage started off, and in a short time reached the palace. This is where my narration ends. Thank you.